Hello, everybody. Martin Patella here for Life Enthusiast Online Radio, coming to you across the internet and through the galactic waves. Today with me, Spencer Feldman from Remedy Link. He is my favorite formulator. I listen to what he has to say because he has got the mind that understands science but can translate it into human speak. So here we are, Spencer Feldman, welcome. Thanks, Martin. Well, you know, I thought we'd uh, talk a little bit about coronavirus. From the public reactions out there, it really feels to a lot of people like an existential threat. You know, there's a lot of unknowns about this. Um, we don't really know what the rate of uh, hospitalization is. We don't really know what the death rate is. And if the rate of hospitalization gets to a certain point, uh, and all the ICUs are closed and people can't get put on ventilators and the drugs aren't available, then the rate of hospitalization becomes the death rate or close there to thereof. And as you're aware, I'm sure not only is China not making raw materials, uh, but now India is also saying that they're not going to be exporting a number of pharmaceuticals because one, they don't have the raw materials and two, they need it for their own people. So specialization of labor has a lot of great advantages but it also makes for a fragile system yeah. we have we have two issues with the coronavirus we have how it will physically play out in terms of people getting sick and then how it will play out from the perception of it socially so for instance um, iran let out a huge number of prisoners now if the police stations are closed because they're quarantined and the prisons are opened up and there's not enough food to go around you can imagine, you can play out what that does to a society. When I started, when the coronavirus started hitting my radar in January, what I wanted to do was, and I gamed it forward and I said, okay, uh, what happens if you can't go to a hospital because it's overrun and they have no supplies? Uh, what do you do at home? You know, what's, how do you MacGyver this? How do you hack the coronavirus? You know, what, what's available? Yeah. And so I, I've made a series of five videos and there'll be a sixth. And I thought I would give you a brief idea of what, what's going through my mind about coronavirus and how I'm prepping. Yes, please, let's have it. So the first thing I thought is, well, China is the one that's making all the, the masks. What happens if masks run out? So uh, in the first video, I explain how you can take a cotton or flannel or a t-shirt and you can mix up uh, two solutions. One is uh, copper and zinc sulfate in water, and the other is 5% vinegar. And this wasn't my idea. This is based on a patent uh, that's linked in one of the videos that says, hey, if you have a face mask and you have layers, and one layer is 5% acid and another layer is copper and zinc sulfate, then as the virus passes through, it can become denatured. I said, oh, wow, that's great. These are common chemicals. You, you know, copper sulfate's available by the ton because they use it uh, as a fungicide on crops. They use it um, uh, as um, a mineral for crops. It's used in, in all over the place. Mm -hmm. So you can go onto Amazon right now and buy a pound of copper sulfate for next to nothing. Zinc sulfate's a little less common, but you can get these. And so I show how if you take a tablespoon of zinc sulfate and a tablespoon of copper sulfate and you mix it in a liter of distilled water, you get this bright blue solution that if you dunk some cloth in and then cut it in a shape and make it a mask, you've got some protection. Now, people will say, hey, that's not as good as a mask. And I'm like, no, it's not. But, you know, masks have been sold out now for weeks. Uh, the best material you could make it out of if you had to would be if you can still get it, you go to a hardware store and they have great big HEPA filters that go into furnace and forced air heating systems and ventilation systems in houses. And if you strip the metal backing off that, you're left with HEPA uh, material. Right on. So the first video is, hey, um, you know, it, it's aimed at, at places where they don't have access to masks. And, you know, what do you do? Well, here's an idea. So the second video, is okay uh let's say you've got it now that's, uh, or you're you're working with someone who has it 
uh, or maybe you have a cough and you don't know if you have it, but you want to, right? or let's say you don't, you're around people or you just don't want to get it. What can we do preventatively and therapeutically both to prevent getting it and if you've got it to do something about it? And if you look at the, the virus, uh, look at most viruses, there are some things they have in common. Uh, this one in particular, like other viruses like the H5N1, uh, has a series of enzymes it uses as part of its mechanism to get in. Now, viruses are very, very simple. And so they have a few moving parts. And if you can interfere with a couple of them, then you're, you know, you've got the odds in your favor. So one of them is uh, hemagglutinin. Uh, that's the protein that attaches the virus to your cells. Yeah. So, I, think, I think it's the spikes that it's on the yeah. surface, right? And so it, it goes on and, you know, they talk about it going to the ACE2 inhibitors. It also goes to the L signs and, and we'll talk about that later. But the first thing it has to do is get from, you know, from your bloodstream or wherever and has to dock onto the cell. So if you can keep it from docking or minimize the docking, if you can interfere with the hemagglutinin, that's one weak spot that the virus can be uh, uh, at, attacked. Yeah, it's unable to dock. You, right. you said it now. Yeah. Now the neuraminidase is another, that's, a pro, uh, that's an enzyme and an ASE, so it's an enzyme. <clears throat> and that gets it uh, kind of into and out of the cell once it's docked. So if you can keep it from, if once it docks, you keep it from entering, or once it enters and replicates, you keep it from, from exiting, there's another place you can interfere with the enzyme. And then the last one I, I would like to interfere with is the replicase enzyme. And that's what, you know, once the, once the, the virus gets in the cell, it dissolves your own DNA. It's, it's kind of grotesque. It dissolves your own DNA and then uses that mix of your dissolved DNA to build itself. And part of that process revolves replicase. That's another enzyme. So if you can keep a number of them from docking. And then those that dock, you can keep some of them from getting in and then from getting out. And then on top of it, make it more difficult for it to replicate. Okay, now you've, you've got uh, what I would say a, a good way to interfere with that virus. Yeah, and it's and, a logarithmic uh, process. So yeah. every level you're making a big difference. Yeah, I, I don't believe in magic bullets. I believe, you know, this is trench warfare. And in trench warfare, a shotgun trumps a sniper rifle, right? We need to go at this with multiple things that you are very difficult to miss with. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we've got three different targets and we're going to hit them all. And if you watch video number two, uh, if you go to Remedy Link on YouTube, not the website, I, I don't put these videos on my website. Uh, I don't want people to think I'm, I'm making these in order to drive advertising. So if you go to Remedy Link's YouTube channel, uh, there's five videos there. Well, we will link it from the uh, show notes. Okay. okay. So if you click on the, on the video number two, it talks about this tea you could make. It's not a tea. It, it's the wrong word. It's an herbal mix. And uh, I give a list of, uh, of things you can use, and I'll read some of them off here. And again, I was going for things that were not esoteric and difficult to find and often in a jungle somewhere that, although might be better, were in such small supply you couldn't find them. So I've got uh, turmeric or curcumin, if you can get the extract, green tea, rosemary, cinnamon, elderberry, astragalus, and resveratrol. And the reason I picked things like um, rosemary and, eld and uh, cinnamon is because you can find those typically in your supermarket or in your cupboard. So I'm aiming at things where you're, you know, maybe you're stuck in the house, maybe it's quarantined, maybe the stores are, it's just not safe to go out, but you have some culinary spices. Okay, you can work with that. The one I am now making for myself and my friends and family, uh, I have in it a privet, which is a little more difficult to find, but you can still get it, uh, elderberry, the fruit, not the flower. Uh, quercetin, which is the extract of turmeric. Brown, uh, brown or red marine algae. And astragalus. Those are the, the ones that I put in my own personal mix. Yeah. And I take a quarter teaspoon every time I wake up, you know, every day when I wake up in the morning, I take a quarter teaspoon. And then if I'm out and about, 
and maybe I've gone into a place where people are coughing or a lot of people in a small area, when I come home, I'll take half a teaspoon. And I'm going to be taking this for probably the next three years because you know, when the 1918 influenza came around in three waves, it took about two years for it to finish. And that makes sense because the solar minimums are two to three years long. Yeah. And that's when our immune system is the lowest. Yeah. Uh, so that's something that you, you, know, you can think of mixing up for yourself and your family. It doesn't taste bad. It actually kind of, the elderberry makes it taste kind of good. Third video I did was people, what happens if we, what about the people in Wuhan who have had their home, their, who've been welded into their homes, right? The front doors were welded shut and, and, and wood was, you know, yeah, nailed up. You what cannot, do these people do? What, I, I am failing to understand the logic. Like they essentially decided that they're not letting them out, period. Yeah, it's a death sentence. These it's people aren't, aren't getting out. Yeah. Yeah, they're killing I mean, them. you can jump out of the window, I suppose. If it's important enough to you, you'll find a way out. You'll take the top of your toilet seat and break through a wall and, and find a way out. I mean, yes, if you're determined enough, where there's yeah. a will, there's a way. And I'm thinking of these people in Wuhan, and I'm thinking of people that, you know, right now you and I can go and buy zinc and copper sulfate online. Yeah. Amazon, eBay, you can go to your pool shop, your, your spa place, and they might have copper sulfate to treat pools for algae, yeah, or your farm store. But I'm, I'm thinking, okay, what about people who can't get those two materials for the masks, either because um, they're no longer available locally or they're, they're stuck inside their house? Yeah. So uh, in one of the videos, um, <clears throat> I show you how to actually make copper chloride uh, and silver chloride. Uh, or, and basically what you do is and you're going to be taking a, a small bit of salt water and a car battery or even just the power supply off some electronics and you're going to create cop, uh, chlorine gas and you're going to have the copper in the chlorine gas it's going to react and you're going to get this green solution of copper chloride mm -hmm. and put a little silver in there like uh, junk silver like pre-65 coins and um, sterling silver is eight to ten percent copper and 90 to 92 percent silver mm -hmm. so i show how you can make zinc and instead of copper i'm uh, sorry copper chloride instead of copper sulfate and silver chloride instead of silver, um, instead of zinc sulfate, because finding zinc around the house, yes, you can get it out of, out of uh, alkaline batteries, but that's a little tricky. Most people have you know, some silverware or something. Maybe, maybe you have some zinc plated nails left in your cupboard. You might have, there, there you go. So, but I show you how to do it with copper and silver, and which will also go after the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Uh, and then I made a fourth video. Now, you know, I've been involved with uh, the work of Rife for 20 years. And uh, for those that don't know, uh, in the early part of the last century, uh, a, a great man named Royal Rife not only invented a microscope that was well beyond its time in terms of what he could see, but then based on what he was seeing under the microscope, he identified a cause of cancer, which at that time was viral. I don't think cancers are predominantly viral anymore which is why I don't think rife machines work as well for cancer, let alone the real, most rife machines are not rife, another conversation. But he also came up with a technology for destroying what he was seeing under the microscope with radio waves. And so in the fourth video, I show how to recreate that with a ham radio. And I posted it. And it's my hope that uh, people who are uh, ham radios will watch this and understand how to use this or maybe some governments will contact me and I'll tell them how to set it up. Uh, but can you, can you redefine ham radio? Uh, what, sure, so a ham radio is um, uh, an electrical device. It's a transceiver. It's something that sends and receives signals in a particular range. In this case, the range I'm looking at is between eight and 20 megahertz. So like a CB radio operates around 27 megahertz. A ham radio has a much wider range it'll operate at. Right. And, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we were, you know, when I first uh, bumped into someone with hepatitis C, I spent a couple of days, found three frequencies that were, he really reacted to. And then he was in front of it for, I don't know how many hours, after a couple of days. And then at, about a week later, we had his blood tested and his viral load went 
down, I think about a thousand fold. It didn't get rid of the hep C, or at least it didn't get rid of the remnant that was being tested, but it took his viral load down significantly. So I don't know if Rife will work with the coronavirus, but heck, it's worth a try. Um, it's scalable, Martin. We could have, uh, instead of 100 watt units for your home, we could have 10,000 watt units uh, outside at, at airports and in hospitals, and then people would walk at a specific distance or be wheeled by a specific distance, mm -hmm. and they could possibly blast this thing up. Yeah, wow. that's just like irradiating the food on the conveyor belt, so to speak, right? Right, except the thing is the frequencies between 8 and 20 megahertz, our bodies are mostly transparent to them, so there's no place the virus can hide, and it's not ionizing. You know, it's a little thermal, but it's not going to burn you. I mean, I've been in front of these things for hours and hours and hours. Um, I got a lot of flack from the ham radio community saying what I was doing was dangerous, and I appreciate their perspective because from how they're trained, from the, the amount of time and the amount of frequency and the amount of wattage you're allowed to be around, yeah, this is not what they're taught is appropriate. Right. But number one, um, there's a pandemic loose. Yeah, and number is, two, this is a uh, warfare. The people that say that this is da dangerous, that's based on very well meaning uh, paperwork. And I've got real world experience, and I would say real world experience trumps a theory on a piece of paper because the people who wrote up the standards for how long you could be in front of at what frequency and how much power, you know, if you read their notes, they're saying, we don't really know, so here's a guess. So I know, because I've been in front of it and I've checked myself and others and I've checked my blood. <coughs> I can tell you at these power levels at these frequencies, it's fine. Uh, the second thing the ham radio enthusiasts are upset about is when we first find this frequency, we're gonna have to scan the whole range and it's gonna create interference. Well, okay, if that bothers you, take aluminum foil and line a, a room and make a Faraday cage, and then the signal won't get out. But again, a small price to pay. If we can find the frequency, then we're done and we can blast it, blast it out on one narrow band. <clears throat> uh, the idea is, you know, I don't think we're destroying the virus because we're killing it because it's not alive. I think what we're doing is somehow denaturing it. This takes us to the fifth video, which is how does the virus actually kill? Now, there is some evidence that the way it kills is twofold. One is a cytokine storm, which is the body reacts so aggressively to the, to the virus, the immune system over responds, the lungs fill with fluid and the person drowns basically in their own lungs. There's another way which the virus, when it gets reinfected, because you can not only be infected with two or multiple strains of the virus simultaneously, but you can get one strain and then another. So there's no immunity to this. Some people believe that the second time you get it, it can ride in on the antibodies because of what looks like um, the inclusion of HIV uh, genetics. Yeah. And then the, the white blood cells break them in and it's called, uh, and the antibodies bring them in. What happens is the antibodies get on from the previous infection, but, and the antibodies are not enough to knock out the virus. And yet, to but, the immune system, it looks like it's taking care of it. Right. And so then it gets brought in to the white blood cells uh, to be destroyed, but it wasn't destroyed. So now it gets brought into the white blood cells by the antibodies, but it's not quite dead. And then it replicates inside the white blood cells, which is this whole HIV angle. So I said, okay, um, I don't have a, a way to deal with that yet, but let's talk about the cytokine storm. <clears throat> Again, I'm thinking, what can you do with stuff that you can source locally, right? It can't be something exotic. Yeah. Uh, and I came up with a few things. Uh, in the first videos, I was talking about chili pepper and licorice. And with a little more um, time to research, uh, I made a video on a way to possibly respond to the cytokine. Now, the cytokines, uh, the, infl the inflammation that happens, uh, this is... Um, mostly tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1 beta. Uh, some of the other ones, uh, the chemokines and interleukin-6 come in later, and then finally interleukin-10 calms everything down. The goal is to calm the immune system down so the person doesn't have so much fluid going into their lungs that they drown, that they die, they can't breathe, right? So you're essentially modulating the immune system into an right. orderly uh, process rather than just all out war, huh? Right. And um, the things I chose were 
uh, hot uh, chili peppers were actually the active ingredient was capsaicin. Yeah. Uh, if you can get capsaicin, great. If you can't, uh, get hot sauce or chili peppers and you can make it or cay cayenne, make it yourself. Yeah. Uh, aloe vera, if you can get the extract, great. If not, get the plant. Bear in mind, some aloe plants are poisonous, so you can't just grab any aloe. You have to know that you're getting an edible version and get the pulp out of that. Um, fish oil and vitamin D and some high proof alcohol. And basically what you do is you put 1 64th of a teaspoon of capsaicin extract, if you can get it, into two ounces of either Everclear, of, uh, which is 190 proof or 200 proof alcohol, yeah. or the highest alcohol you can get, right? But 1 64th of a teaspoon in there. And then, because uh, uh, capsaicin will dissolve in alcohol. And then you put four drops of that in a quarter of a teaspoon or half a teaspoon of fish oil. Again, fish oil is anti-inflammatory. Right. And then you're going to mix some vitamin D in that. Drink that and then take some aloe. Now, let's say you, if you don't have um, capsaicin, you, that's easy. It's hot sauce. Um, it's uh, uh, jalapeno peppers, right? Things you might find in your, in your cupboard. Yeah. If you don't have vitamin D, by all means, you should go get it. Now, let me tell you why vitamin D. Not only does it regulate cytokines, but you'll see that pandemics um, are more virulent in the cloudier and colder months. So spring, winter, and fall, they come off, they're much worse. And in the summer, they tend to back down. I believe that's because uh, with more ultraviolet light, not only is it slightly sterilizing the air, but it's giving us more um, vitamin D. And vitamin D is important to not, for your viral response and to calm down the cytokines. But let's say you are watching this video and it's too late and you can't get vitamin D. Can you get liver? Animal and fish liver is full of vitamin D, right? So these are ways you can hack it. Uh, and that mix, the cytokine storm mix, I don't suggest you take until, and God forbid, you start, a person starts having a respiratory distress. If they're just having the symptoms of flu, you know, achy, fevery, muscle ache, don't do it yet. Wait until the very, very first, because we don't want to turn, we don't want to suppress the immune response at that point. We want to fight the, the, the virus as much as we can. If the body starts overreacting and it starts getting short of breath, then I would start taking a shot of that, you know, every 15 minutes to half an hour until I felt it calmed down and I could find the rate that I could have just a little bit of inflammation, but keep it in a minimum. Yeah. But here's the thing though. Once you get out the other end of that, it's not, it's not done because now there's secondary infections. So once the shortness of breath goes away, immediately stop the cytokines and start them up again if it comes back. But stop the cytokines and then go back to the original stuff, which was uh, the elderberry and all those other things. Mind you, don't use elderberry during a cytokine storm. It raises inflammatory cytokines. So basically what we're trying to do is have the immune system fight the virus up until a point where the damage to the lungs is worse than the virus. Deal with that. And then when that's done, get right back into stimulating the immune system to fight any secondary infections. That was the, uh, the fifth video. Uh, there's one more video coming out. Uh, it'll probably come out tomorrow. So by the time your audience is watching this, it should already be uh, video number six, I guess is what it is. Um, when I first started hearing about this, um, I spent a day walking outside doing errands as if it was a pandemic. So I had the mask on, I had gloves on, and I got a lot of funny looks. Uh, I didn't do it because I was concerned that the pandemic was um, there, you know, where I was. I was doing it as a test run to see what it was like and what kind of things would, did I need to learn. Yeah. And what I learned is it's very difficult to act like it's in a pandemic. You know, when someone comes up and is talking to you, there's a, a socially appropriate distance. And if you take two or three steps back, because just a person just exhaling at you and talking to you within six feet can give it to you, you'd start taking a couple of steps back. It's socially uncomfortable. Yeah, right? so you have to get used he'll follow to it. you instead of raising his voice, right? You have to get used to it. How, how, you know, I tried things like having one glove on when I went to a store and that would be the glove that I would use on the push carts. And then the other glove would be for other things. And it, that didn't work. I needed two gloves. I couldn't, my, I was too used to touching things with both hands. So these are the lessons, you know, I needed two gloves. 
there are times I wouldn't bring the mask with me. It would be in the car. I'm like, I won't need it. I go in the store, there's three people coughing. So the other lesson is I've always got the mask. If I leave my car, the mask is around my neck where I can put it on. I've got a glove on each hand and a few more in my pocket. These are the cheap food service gloves. Yeah. You can use the more expensive um, nitrile ones, but you know, you don't, you can get 500 of the food service gloves, you know, for 10 bucks if you can still get them. Right. And so I started practicing what it was like to, you know, not shake people's hands. Now I don't get so many weird looks, people understand. But what I want to pose to you is mm. we have certain social habits and they don't change instantly. So you need to start practicing changing those habits now so that if you need them, the proper habit for this time period we're going through is functioning. Yeah. And the one thing I couldn't figure out how to do, like I got, you know, non-touch soap dispensers from my bathroom and things like that. But there were places that I would touch that were sort of intermediary, like my steering wheel, like the doorknob of my house, like the faucet that, you know, I didn't want to keep sterilizing. And what, so I, what I, and this is going to be the, the, the last uh, video number six is my experiment with this. I got one mil copper foil and I'm going to wrap it around places that are commonly touched. Like my doorknob, like my steering wheel, like a stick shift. Like if I can get it into the handles of my door, I might even wrap my debit card uh, you know, with a little cutout for the, um, for the chip. And the, I, the thing is, um, copper uh, you know, denatures the virus. Yeah. So that way, when you go to touch your door, everybody that touches their door, you don't have to worry about a thousand people touching your doorknob and maybe someone forgot to, to, you know, to wear gloves that day. So these are my, my, uh, my thoughts on, you know, how, we're, how to kind of prep for this. Uh, right. So in your thought process, have you considered vitamin C? Yeah, sure. Uh, it doesn't rank as highly as some of the other things in terms of like vitamin D. Uh, or, um, you know, capacin or those, uh, I would certainly use it if I had it. Uh, but I consider the ones I mentioned my first go-to. Um, other alternatives suggested out there? I mean, certainly the uh, rosemary and cinnamon, we have also been recommending oregano. Oregano is good. The thing about oregano, I, I tend to think of oregano more for fungus than for viruses. It's also pretty caustic. Uh, it's strong you know, stuff. Taking, yeah, taking oregano in the amounts that I think you'd need long term, I think they're going to irritate the kidneys. So I like to think of oregano as a short term thing. Um, so yeah. oregano is not going to be my main, you know, again, it, it's something well, you can use. Again, my it's thought. My first choice. Yeah, again, my thought on the oregano was well, I'll take a drop after I come home from a subway ride kind of thing. Yeah, sure. If that's, if that's what you have, then by all means use it. I'm not against oregano, I'm just comparing it its pros and cons next to some other things. I am shocked that you did not recommend a single remedy link product, that this is just simple hacks from the pantry. I could take all the products and, and make them and sell them, but uh, I won't, unfortunately, for two reasons. One, uh, I don't want people to think that there's a, a financial angle to this. So if I tell you to go out and do it yourself, then you're not thinking, well, he's just trying to make money on this. And the second is, if I were to sell something like what I've described on how to make, uh, the FDA would not be very pleased with that. Yes. So the information I, I can give you. I had, yeah, thank you. I had a similar experience. We had a product on the shelf called Flu Stop, which in its own name was a breach of something, some rules. Right. And it was a um, inhibitor of the replication capacity of this H1 H anything and anything virus. It was just mm -hmm. essentially giving it a haircut, stopping the knobs from being able to penetrate, inject themselves into new cells. And it was a herbal, just uh, old fashioned Chinese herbs. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was awesome, awesomely effective. And the guy went broke selling it because not enough people bought it. Mm. Well, you know, to say it's just herbal, that's where many drugs are coming from. Tamiflu uh, comes from, you know, is an extract of an herb. Herbs are plants' evolutionary response to the same things that we're going through. Plants get viruses, plants get cancer, plants get fungus. Right. They've had millions of years to come up with lots of great, clever solutions. So yeah, I wouldn't say just an herb. I'd say, oh, wow, that's genius. 
thank you, small uh, Amazonian flower, for figuring out how to stop this disease. Yeah. And why not get multiple angles on it? So yeah, I mean, I think herbs um, should be treated with great respect because they are they were our first pharmaceutical teachers, and still we have a lot to learn from them. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, think about what's, you know, um, you know, China's uh, not able to get materials out. India is not shipping uh, a number of key pharmaceuticals and may in the future not you know, increase the list of things that are not going to ship us. Uh, if you have a plant that you can go to, then you are at least a little more independent. I mean, we don't have uh, medicine gardens anymore, but maybe we could. You know, if you can grow some things in your garden, then your supply chain is in the back, you know, just your backyard. Right on. One other thing I thought of is lecithin. Mm. It's documented that lecithin, with its emulsifying action, is able to help the immune system to essentially strip off the uh, lipid coating that the virus uses to disguise itself. It's essentially, the virus behaves like a wolf with sheep's clothing. It has mm -hmm. this cloaking uh, lipid layer on itself to make it look innocent. And the mm. lecithin dissolves it away and makes the virus more visible to the immune system. Well, uh, the reason I picked alcohol was because capsaicin is dis can dissolve in alcohol and in, then you can dissolve it in fat. Well, uh, lecithin can also um, mix well, is visible with uh, alcohol and fat. Yes. In fact, that's how you make that's how you make lecithin. You take a uh, organic solvent, and you take the oil, like for example, I don't know, sunflower oil or mm -hmm. uh, or soy oil, and you separate the uh, fats from the lecithin using the organic solvent. Then get rid of the organic solvent, and you you have the lecithin left behind. Interesting. Well, thank you. I'm going to go look that up. That uh, you know, the more the merrier. Everything we can throw at this virus, you know. No. The more the, be the more the better. And the other thing is the more options someone has, you know, if you give them 10 or 20 different ingredients they can use, you know, maybe they can only source 10, but there you go. You don't know which ones they're going to have access to. So give a broad range. Okay. Well, I hope to talk to you in a year, looking back at this thing saying we helped people. Thank you very much. This has been Spencer Feldman and Martin Patella at Life Enthusiast Online Radio. We are restoring vitality to you and to the planet. See us at life-enthusiast.com.